Well, good morning. And welcome to uh, today's worship service. I'm glad that those who are here uh, did not allow something like an earthquake to prevent you from uh, coming to worship today. Glad to have you with us. I also wanted to acknowledge those who may be watching online today with our first live stream service. Uh, glad that you are with us as well. Um, for those of you who may be visiting for the first time, a, a special welcome to you. Uh, we're so glad that you're here. And uh, sometime during the service, we'd ask that you take a minute to complete the white card that's in the pocket in the chair in front of you. Uh, there's information on the front and the back, and uh, fill out as much of that as you're comfortable doing, and you can drop it in one of the offering plates on your way out. That'll give us a record of your visit, but also give us an opportunity to connect with you uh, later in the week. So thanks for coming, and we hope to see you again soon. As we get started today, uh, I just wanted to turn it over to Heather, and she has an announcement about Operation Christmas Child. Well, as you know, we had to cancel our packing party last week, which made me very sad. But since we had it all spread out on the table, uh, Pastor Rex did not make me put it back into the box of the bag, which I really appreciate. And we got my family together, and we packed 74 full boxes and um, 16 partial boxes. So thank you to all of you who donated. Um, that was a total much more than I expected. Um, right now on stage, we have 120 full shoe boxes. <laughs> and we have 20 more in the car. Out of the so that's 140, and my goal is 125. Hi. I think we're going to blow that out of the water. So thank you, everybody who so far has turned in boxes. Um, we have enough shipping money to cover 76 of the boxes from the packing party. And don't try to do this math. If you want to talk to me about it afterwards, <laughs> I will explain it to you. But right now, I need $171 left to ship what we packed at the packing party. So if you feel that's something you can do, you can talk to me afterwards. Uh, also, we had some stuff left over from the packing party. So if you need some stuff for your personal boxes you're packing or you want to start a box, um, we can give you a good head start on that. If you just want to know what it's about, you can talk to me. Um, one really exciting thing about these shoe boxes is they are being used to reach people in unreached people groups because the tribal leaders are letting Samaritan's Purse bring gifts in for the children and they are able to share the gospel through that when they won't allow any other organizations into these areas. So that's, ju that's just one thing that they're really um, excited about and it's something that we can do. It seems so simple, but it, it's touching people that are so far unreached with the gospel. So if you have any questions, see me after. Um, like I said, we have stuff in the back that can help you get started on your box or just add to what you have. Okay. Thank you, Heather, and thank you for everyone who uh, has contributed to the boxes. It's great to be able to report that we've met our goal, uh, exceeded our goal for the year. Um, also wanted you know, typically on Wednesday nights, uh, we've been holding a Zoom small group meeting uh, where we have been discussing uh, the sermon in greater detail. Uh, we're still going to have a Zoom meeting this coming Wednesday, uh, but it will be a little bit different than normal in that we will be having as special guests our, our missionaries to the Philippines, uh, Russ and Ramona Simons, uh, who will be uh, interacting with us uh, probably for the final time as they are looking to retire at the end of this year. And uh, so I want to encourage you to, uh, uh, you'll send out, I'm going to send out a link uh, in the next couple days inviting those who are part of our email group as a church to, to, to join us for that, and I'd love to see you come out. Uh, just uh, by way of reminder, last week we did take a love offering for the Simons to help them with the transition. Uh, today you are still able to, to give towards that love offering if you'd like to. Uh, if you're going to write a check, just make sure on your memo line that you designate that it's a love offering for the Simons so we make sure that that gets to them. And I want to thank you for that. Let's uh, stand at this time, and I'm going to pray before turning it over to the worship team. Father, again, I thank you for the privilege of being able to gather together this morning as the people of God. Uh, even as we live in times of peril and uncertainty, our hope and our confidence is in you. And may our worship express that confidence this morning. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.
Good morning. It is good to be here. Uh, a quick reminder, we are live streaming this morning. So in a moment, I'm going to ask for prayer requests and praises. So if there's anything that you do not, not want shared uh, globally, just see one of the pastors and we'll put it on the prayer chain. Uh, I'd like to open with three verses that I won't make any comment on because I know a lot of people had a challenging week uh, centered around our country. This comes from Daniel, Daniel 2, 19 through 21. During the night, the mystery was revealed to Daniel in a vision. Then Daniel praised the God of heaven and said, praise be the name of God forever and ever. Wisdom and power are his. He changes time and seasons. He disposes kings, he deposes kings, and raises up others. He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to the discerning. Uh, a close friend of mine sent me that because he knew I was lamenting. And it goes with today's CBN verse um, that the Lord always knows what I need to hear. And this one was very personal for me. And... Uh, some here will understand why. The verse is uh, Hebrews 5, 8. Even though Jesus was God's son, he learned obedience from the things he suffered. Prayer requests and praises. I'd like to open up with a praise. Uh, we have been praying for Scott Burns. Scott Burns uh, is the nephew of Charlene Allen, who has been coming recently. And he's been in a hospital for, for quite a while. He's had COVID along with some other issues, uh, and he has just gone home. So our prayers are working, and that's another thing I feel uh, I'm a living testimony to. So let's start with that. And what do we have this morning uh, that we would like to, like to uh, offer up in prayer? or praise. Karen. Thank you, Karen. We have a lot to be thankful for from our Lord. Uh, life, liberty, property, all the items that you mentioned. 
Um, but it was reminded to me that although we may have changed the leaders of the country, we did not change our leader. Other prayer requests? Uh, Miss Kathy. Okay, thank you, Kathy. Um, a great prayer. We always have to keep our leaders in prayer. Uh, that is, uh, should be on our devotions daily. And if you don't have devotions, it's a good time to start. Anyone else? Prayer requests? Uh, yes, Kathy. Thank you very much, Kathy. We are praying for Kathy's mother uh, on the transition side towards uh, of life. Um, they're coming up with a plan, and we know that God has a plan uh, with each of us in mind, and he gives us what we need. So we will pray for that, Kathy. And your mother's first name? Teresa. Teresa, I knew that. Mother Teresa to you, right? Not me. <laughs> Gail. Okay, Gail, we're going to pray for your son, Peter. Uh, pneumonia, COVID, intermingled, uh, needs attention uh, and needs salvation. Amber. Amen. Thank you, Amber, for uh, your pregnancy, the continuation, the health of the baby. Um, do you have a preference? No, that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, it's live stream, so that's why, I, you know, okay, we'll uh, be happy with a new life. Other prayer requests, praises? Mr. Lilam, Guy. I just want to echo the concern for our nation in this transitional period. And if I could quote George Washington, truth will ultimately prevail where there is pain free of glory. Okay, we're praying for our nation from uh, Mr. Lilam. Uh, Truth will prevail, prevail from uh, George Washington. And uh, we know God has a plan, and he's got a plan for each of us. 
and he's doing what's best for each of us. So I pray for myself that I have the wisdom to understand and accept that plan and be joyous and praise God and rejoice in him. I'm not happy, (laughs) but I'm going to do everything that scripture tells me to do because of the verse that I read before, 5.8 in Hebrews, um, you become obedient through suffering. Any other prayer requests or praises? Okay, seeing none, we will turn these over to the Lord. Everyone has heard them. Everyone's going to carry them in their hearts as they leave here and pray fervently for them during the week. Uh, Father, we have uh, common themes in our prayers this morning uh, for our country, uh, for uh, items such as our life, our liberty, our property, our prosperity. Father, so many things that we know you are in control of. And if by chance something gets in a way we don't understand it, uh, Father, maybe that's exactly what we need or I need. Uh, I may have become too reliant on something that uh, I should not be. Uh, We're going to pray for our leaders. Father, have them come to you uh, because then decisions will be so much better. Uh, Father, for uh, Gail's son, Peter, for the uh, challenges, COVID, other elements, pneumonia, uh, and we rejoice with, uh, we rejoice with uh, Charlene Allen and her nephew, uh, Scott Burns, for healing. So we pray for that healing uh, for Peter, for Amber, for the baby, for the new life. Father, what a blessing that is. Uh, May that just be, um, may health be uh, just a great path, Father. Joy, and may that baby grow up to know you. Uh, Father, when we have health concerns, uh, again, something personal for me, but health concerns and elections pale by the element of salvation, knowing you. So Father, if we have that and we are secure that we are never going to die, Father, there is no greater joy on earth. So thank you, Father, for all of the rich blessings you've given me and my family. And I pray everyone in here, I ask for wisdom for all so we can sin less tomorrow than we did yesterday. In your name we pray. Amen. Our reading this morning, uh, well first of all we have uh, baskets in the back for collection. Uh, We no longer pass the the collection plate so feel free to drop your uh, your contribution in there. Uh, Our reading this morning uh, is entitled Paul's Chains advance the gospel. Verses 12 through 14 in chapter, Pastor, help me out. Chapter 1, I knew that in Philippians, that's where we are. Now I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that what has happened to me has actually served to advance the gospel. As a result, it has become clear throughout the whole, uh, throughout the whole uh, palace guard and to everyone else that I am in chains for Christ. And because of my chains, most of the brothers and sisters have become confident in the Lord and dare all the more to proclaim the gospel without fear.
I want to encourage you to take out the sermon notes, uh, which you can find in today's bulletin. Uh, although this next Wednesday, uh, we're not going to have a sermon-based discussion in our Zoom meeting, I did include some discussion questions still on the back of your sermon notes uh, so that you can use it uh, for a personal study or if you want to have a discussion at the family level as a family unit and talk through these things. I would encourage you to do that. Uh, in his book, Onward, Engaging the Culture Without Losing the Gospel, Russell Moore proposes that American culture is shifting into an era in which religion is not necessarily seen as a social good. From the beginning, Moore argues, Christian values were always more popular in America than the gospel itself. Now, however, it is increasingly clear that American culture doesn't just reject the tenets of Orthodox Christianity, it also rejects key aspects of traditional values. When the moral majority was, was formed, as a cultural political organization in the 1970s and 80s. Most Americans agreed on certain traditional values, such as marriage and family and faith and religion. And the argument was that this consensus represented the real America and that for evangelical Christians, Christianity represented the best way to preserve these values and to attain these ideals. But as the culture changes all around us, it is no longer possible to pretend that we are a moral majority. Americans no longer agree on traditional values, and most people have no desire to live up to the church's view of morality. In fact, Christians are often viewed today as the ones who are strange and out of touch with the real America. At one point in the book, uh, Moore speaks of a conversation that he had with a lesbian progressive activist in a major urban cultural center. She was most interested in the sexual ethic of evangelical Christians and peppered more with questions about why we thought certain sexual practices were sinful. And as Moore began to present a biblical worldview on marriage and sexuality, the woman began to laugh at him, stating he was the first person she'd ever met who believed that sexual expression ought only to take place within marriage and that marriage could only happen with the union of a man to a woman. And she followed this up by saying this, do you see how strange what you're saying sounds to those of us here in normal America? How things have turned around. Most Christians would consider themselves to be normal America, and they would view this woman with her sexual openness and her dismissal of monogamy 
as being out of touch with traditional values. But I suspect she's right, that more and more she represents the moral majority in our country. Men and women who are committed to the values of personal autonomy and sexual freedom. She represents the new normal. And as Christians in America are increasingly viewed as being both socially awkward and subversive, we tend to either clench our fists or wring our hands. And we should do neither. So how can we best engage with our culture today? Well, the text that we're going to look at this morning will explain how. Please open up your Bibles with me again to Philippians chapter 1, verses 12 to 14. We are continuing our study of the book of Philippians. Uh, we've seen that in verses 1 through 11 that Paul thanked God for the Philippians. He expressed his love for them, and then he prayed for them. And now in verses 12 to 26, Paul gives the church a report on his present situation and his outlook on his future. The present report will be the focus of our study over the next few weeks. So today's passage breaks down simply. In verses 12 to 14, Paul conveys his positive attitude while imprisoned in Rome. Why can he be positive? It's because the gospel is advancing. And he mentions two ways in particular that it's advancing. People are hearing the gospel and believers are speaking the gospel boldly. Look at verse 12 with me. Paul says, Now I want you to know, brothers, that what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel. The Christians of Philippi were, were deeply concerned about Paul. They knew that he was in custody, awaiting trial before the supreme tribunal of the empire. And they were wondering, how is he faring right now? H had his case already gone to trial? And, and if so, then what would be the outcome of the tribunal's verdict? Would, would Paul be, um, would he be condemned or would he be acquitted? And in order to answer these questions, Paul writes to give them an update concerning his condition. He affirms that many of the reports that they've heard about him are true. He is, in fact, still in chains, and his future remains uncertain. Yet he wants the Philippians to know that all of these difficulties have worked out for the greater furtherance of the gospel. And when Paul says, what has happened to me, he could be referring to everything that's taken place from Jerusalem to Rome. This would include a riot, a two-year imprisonment in Caesarea, an appeal to Caesar, the threat on his life, a shipwreck on the way to Rome, his house arrest with restricted freedom, and his impending trial. And whether Paul is speaking about all of these events or just his present situation in Rome, one thing is clear. All of these things have served to advance the gospel. Advance in this context refers to the forward movement of something in spite of obstacles, dangers, and distractions. It was used of an explorer or army advance team hacking a path through dense trees and underbrush moving ahead slowly and with considerable effort. And what Paul is saying here is that instead of hindering the gospel, his imprisonment actually served to make it known. The things that had happened to Paul were quite different from the things that Paul had planned for himself. 
Paul was the great missionary to the Gentiles, and for years he had carried the gospel to, to various parts of the world. He had traveled through Syria and Crete, through most of what is now Turkey, and through Greece. And somewhere along the way, he conceived a plan of taking the gospel to the far west, to Spain, after returning once more to Jerusalem and stopping for a visit in Rome. But you understand that Paul's plans were never realized, not in the way that he had planned. Instead, he found himself a prisoner on trial for his life. And at the time that he wrote the book of Philippians, Paul did not know for certain whether he would be kept confined or set free, whether he would be put to death or be allowed to live. But notice that Paul's concern is not for his personal safety, but for the gospel of Jesus Christ to move forward, whatever it costs him. And that was because for Paul, the advance of the gospel, it overrode everything else. It was more important to him than anything else. What, what was it that Paul must have believed about the gospel? What, what truths of the gospel must he have clung to for him to be willing to suffer for its sake? And I think there's three things that came to my mind as I thought about it. Certainly, Paul would have believed that the gospel contains the only good news for a fallen and broken world. We live in a broken world today, not because there are differences of opinion, not because people hold different worldviews or different ideologies. We live in a broken world today because of sin, because of the inherent sin that dwells within each one of us. And that sin leans us towards evil. We aren't born into this world morally neutral. We already have a bent towards that which is evil and that which is wicked. And because that sin nature resides within us, we act on it and we commit sinful acts against God. We disobey his commands. And in that way, we rebel against his authority over our lives. And because of that, we are deserving of judgment. But God does not want to judge all of his creation for the sins that we've committed against him. And he has provided a way of forgiveness. And he has provided a way for us to be reconciled to him. And that is through the cross. And Paul knew that. Paul knew that when God sent his only son, Jesus Christ, into this world, he sent him here to pay the penalty for our sin so that we would not have to do that. And that those of us who put our faith and trust in Jesus Christ and what he accomplished for us on the cross, we would receive God's forgiveness. We would be reconciled to God. And Paul knew that. And he was willing to suffer for the sake of the gospel. Paul wrote in Romans 1.16, I am not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God for the salvation of everyone who believes, first for the Jew, then for the Gentile. Secondly, Paul would have firmly held to this truth that the gospel enables us to live the life to which God has called us. Not only is the gospel sufficient to save us, it is sufficient to sustain us and to empower us to live the lives that God has called us to live as his sons and his daughters in right relationship with him. We cannot live lives of love and joy and peace, and patience, and goodness, and kindness, and, and uh, self-control without living in light of the gospel and what God has done for us in Christ. And Paul knew that. He wrote in Colossians chapter 1, verse 6, all over the world, this gospel is bearing fruit. That is, people are hearing the good news. They are responding to it. They are putting their faith in Jesus Christ, and they're growing and he says, as it has been doing among you, he's writing to believers, since the day you heard it and understood God's grace and all of its truth. He's saying the gospel that you've heard is continuing to have an impact on your life, to continue to influence you towards righteousness 
And Paul knew that and was willing to suffer for the gospel. And then lastly, Paul was absolutely convinced that the gospel brings God the greatest glory. When we look out and see the creation, we see the glory of God. Psalm chapter 19, verse 1, the heavens declare the glory of God. But we only see certain attributes of God when we look out at the creation. We, we see that he is a wise God, an intelligent God. He's a powerful God, a creative God. But it's in the gospel that we see other attributes of God, his love and his mercy and his grace and his willingness to forgive. And that is such an astonishing part of God's character that the angels are even, are even amazed by it because they have not personally experienced God's grace. Those who rebelled against God and sided with Satan were cast out of heaven, never with an opportunity to repent and be restored. But the angels who stayed with God, they, they see how God interacts with mankind. And now he, how he does show grace and mercy. And they are amazed by it. And, and Paul was willing to suffer for the sake of the gospel because he knew that it brought God glory. He wrote in Romans chapter 16, verses 25 and 27. This is the very end of his letter to the church in Rome. And he finishes with this doxology. And it's just a, an abbreviation of it. But he says, now to him who is able to establish you by my gospel... Be glory forever through Jesus Christ. Amen. And far from lamenting or resenting or complaining about his hardships, Paul acknowledged them as an unavoidable part of his ministry. And in his own eyes, they were but a small cost that he was more than willing to pay because he knew that God used those trials as a means of advancing the gospel. John Bunyan's preaching was so popular and powerful and so unacceptable to leaders in the 17th century Church of England that he was jailed in order to silence him. But refusing to be silent, Bunyan began to preach in the jail courtyard and he not only had a large audience of prisoners, but also hundreds of the citizens of Bedford and the surrounding area would come to the prison daily and stand outside to hear him expound the scriptures. And so his jailers wanted to silence him verb verbally, and they did so by placing him deep within the jail and forbidding him to preach at all. Yet in all of that silence, he spoke loudest of all and to more people than he ever could have imagined because it was during this time that he wrote Pilgrim's Progress, the great Christian classic that has ministered the gospel to tens of millions of people around the world. And for several centuries, Pilgrim's Progress was the most widely read and translated book in the world other than the Bible. And Bunyan's opponents were able to stop him from preaching for a few years, but they were not able to stop his ministry. Instead, they provided an opportunity for his ministry to be extended far deep within a jail into the small town of Bedford and to the ends of the earth. And as Paul discusses his imprisonment, his aim is that the Philippians will be more confident in their own witness for the gospel. He updates them concerning his difficulty so that uh, as they face their own persecution and their own opposition to the gospel, that they too will stand up and testify for the Lord. And this news was designed to embolden them. Paul's report should have the same effect on us as well. In the face of whatever resistance that we may encounter for the gospel, whether at work or home or with extended family and friends, we too must speak the truth with increasing confidence. We must be persuaded that whatever obstacles we face in our witnessing, they are not impediments to the gospel of Jesus Christ. 
Rather, what we view as obstacles are often opportunities to further the advance of the gospel. In what ways did Paul's imprisonment serve to advance the gospel? Paul mentions two ways. Number one, he says people are hearing the gospel. Look at verse 13. Paul says, as a result, it has become clear throughout the whole palace guard and to everyone else that I am in chains for Christ. Um, All of you have heard of Martin Luther King. Well, King supported and often participated in nonviolent acts of civil disobedience. And uh, King was arrested for this on several occasions. But the most well-known occasion took place in 1963 during major demonstrations in Birmingham, Alabama. And before uh, being released nine days later, King wrote his letter from Birmingham jail, a, a document that today is the most quoted and influential of all of his writings. Probably his, his speech, uh, I Have a Dream, is more well known, but of his writings, this is the most popular. And uh, without a doubt, King was the most famous inmate ever held at the Birmingham City Jail. And I'm sure word of his arrest and the cause for which he stood spread like wildfire throughout the community. Paul also was a distinguished prisoner, a Roman citizen exercising his right to have his case heard before the emperor. And he made sure that everyone he came in touch with knew that it was on account of the gospel that he was under house arrest and not because of some kind of criminal conduct. So in his mind, Paul was in Rome as a witness, not as a defendant. Who was hearing the gospel? Paul mentions the palace guard, literally the praetorium guard. The palace guard or the praetorium guard were the emperor's official bodyguards in Rome who also were entrusted with watching over imperial prisoners. They consisted of some 10,000 hand-picked soldiers who were honored with double pay, good pensions, and special duties. And many of them would have had personal contact with Paul or would have been assigned individually to guard him during the course of his imprisonment. Paul also mentions that everyone else has heard the gospel, and this is probably a reference to the inhabitants of Rome in general. News of this extraordinary prisoner would have naturally spread through the Praetorian barracks and in turn out into the city streets. Paul's situation would have become the talk of the town. And in this way, the gospel spread. We have to visualize the scene uh, at this point. Paul is imprisoned in Rome, chained to a Roman guard. And what did Paul do in that situation? He could have complained, this is unjust, this is not right. He could have complained, the Roman law is too slow, I've been here two years. When is this ever going to end? He could have said, this soldier that I'm chained to represents all that Rome stands for, and I can't bear the sight of him. But that wasn't Paul's way. He himself was a soldier of Jesus Christ. And he saw the guard at the end of the chain as representing someone who was a, for whom Christ died. And Paul chose to witness not only to this soldier, but also to the one who replaced him for the second watch, and the one who replaced him for the third watch, and so on and so so forth throughout the days and the years. And in this way, over time, Paul reached most of the palace guard. And as a new soldier is chained to him, I can hear Paul silently praying, thank you, Lord. Here's another one I can tell about Jesus. How many many of the palace guard actually became Christians is, is unknown. But those who did become Christians also became evangelists. How do I know that? Keep your finger here in Philippians 1 and turn with me back to Philippians 4. 
Philippians 4, verse 22. Very end of Paul's letter, a section that includes his final greetings to the believers in Philippi. He says this in verse 22. All the saints here in Rome send you greetings, especially those who belong to Caesar's household. So the implication is that there are a number of Christians who reside within Caesar's household. Now that may or may not include some of his own family, but it certainly included some of the staff and people working for him. And the question is, well, how did they come to know Christ as their Savior? And it's assumed that they were reached for Christ by some of the palace guard. Paul did not just make the best of a bad situation. He turned it around for God's glory. And we never know how God might use a bad situation to advance the gospel. We, we started today by talking about the shift in our culture away from Christian values to some other new normal. And we could look at that as Christians as being a bad situation. And we could choose to complain about that. How terrible what our nation has become. If only so-and-so was present, if only so-and-so was in charge, things would be different. Or we could look at someone like this lesbian progressive activist and say, you know, she represents everything that I hate about this country. I can't stand the sight of her. Or we could respond like Paul and say, you know what, this is someone for whom Christ died. This is someone that I have the opportunity to tell about Jesus. God can use that bad situation from our perspective if we choose to turn it around for his glory. Another way that the gospel was advancing, Paul says, is that believers are sharing the gospel because of my chains, because of my imprisonment. Believers are sharing the gospel, and in this way the gospel is advancing. Look at verse 14. Because of my chains, most of the brothers in the Lord have been encouraged to speak the word of God more courageously and fearlessly. Who were these brothers who were proclaiming the gospel without fear? Clearly, it's the believers in Rome that Paul has in mind. And the implication is that before Paul's imprisonment, the Christians were afraid, or at least reluctant, to openly share their faith. But when the believers saw Paul's boldness, even as his own life was in danger, his example inspired them to become more courageous as well, so that they were much more bold in proclaiming the good news of Christ. I've come to see that persecuted Christians often inspire otherwise timid believers. Um, many of you have probably heard of Jim Elliott. Uh, after Jim Elliott and his four missionary friends were brutally killed by the Aka Indians in 1956, a high number of Wheaton College graduates offered themselves as missionaries in the years following. Inspired by the persecution of these men down in Ecuador. And a similar thing was happening through Paul's sufferings. Christians were becoming more confident, more bold, and were speaking fearlessly. And if Paul could, their, their rationale was this, if Paul can preach in prison fearlessly, then we can preach outside of prison. This was an unexpected result of Paul's imprisonment, something that nobody foresaw was going to happen. In an effort to silence the truth, the Roman authorities had incarcerated the one who spoke it, but their plan did not work. Paul had been bound, but the word of God had not been bound. And what begins as a word to relieve the Philippians of concern evolves into a word about the current spread of the gospel. And one can scarcely miss the focus of Paul's priority here and always 
Christ and the gospel. Paul's singular longing regarding his trial is that Christ will be honored and glorified. Paul is consumed with the gospel. He has put the gospel first in his affections and priorities. I heard the story of a man who was driving one day and the car in front of him accidentally hit a guy on his bicycle and knocked him down. The car wasn't moving that fast. The cyclist was not injured. But the cyclist was furious. And when he got up off of the ground, he pounded on the hood of the driver's car. And in his rage, he went over to the driver's side of the door, opened it, and began kicking and punching the driver who happened to be a 75-year-old man. And determined to help, the man in the car behind the one that caused the accident got out and pulled the cyclist off of the older man. My guess is that all of you um, would probably respond in the same way if you were in a similar situation. You would have gotten out of your car and done something you would have had the courage to intervene. But how many of you would share the gospel with a 75-year-old man who's sitting alone in a restaurant? Would you engage in a spiritual conversation with him? Why is it that we find it so easy to be courageous in physical matters, but difficult in this spiritual matter? Why are we so timid when it comes to sharing the gospel? Well, one thing's for sure, courage is contagious. Now, I'm sure some of you are thinking that Christians should always be bold in their witness for Christ and that Christians should always be ready to give a defense for what we believe, and that's true. But it's equally true that many Christians are shy or afraid. They simply may lack an example in their life of how to do this. And it may be that God has placed you in a position where your witness can move one of his shy children or fearful children to greater boldness. Back to what I was talking about at the beginning of today's message. How are we to engage a culture that is becoming more and more secular and hostile to Christian values? But we're not to give up on the American culture altogether. We're not to retreat back into our local churches. We're not to compromise God's truth. Instead, we are to engage the culture with the gospel. We were never called by Jesus Christ to promote our values. Our mission is to proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ. We are to speak of sin and righteousness, and judgment, and Christ in his coming kingdom. We are to witness to a gospel that seeks not only to reconcile people with one another, but seeks to reconcile people with God by doing away with the obstacle to such communion, our sin and our guilt. And the reality is that in the day in which we find ourselves, we will probably have to articulate concepts we previously assumed other people already understood, such as marriage and family and faith and religion. And we have to define these categories in terms of creation and in terms of the gospel. And we ought not to shy away from sharing with the people of our culture, this is what the Bible says. This is what God has said. But we need to do this with love and with patience and with kindness. They are not the enemy. Satan is our enemy. They are souls we are trying to reach for Christ. They are people for whom Christ died. We should have been doing this all along. But now we will be forced to simply to be understood by the people of our culture. Our end goal is not a Christian America, either of the made-up past or the hoped-for future. Our end goal is the kingdom of Christ, 
made up of every tribe and nation and language. The call to gospel-focused engagement with our culture is a call to a more active, vocal presence in public life because it seeks to ground such witness where it ought to be in the larger mission of the church, making more and better disciples of Jesus. And as we proclaim the gospel to people in a culture that has drastically changed, we will be considered strange, if not subversive. But we also will have the opportunity to reclaim our witness as those who confess that we are foreigners and strangers on earth, that this, worth, this, this world is not our home. Our home is with our Savior, Jesus Christ. And this strangeness starts with the most important thing that differentiates us from the rest of the world, our belief in the gospel of Jesus Christ. So let's engage our culture with the gospel. Let's do so with a greater concern for the advance of the gospel than for our own personal comfort and safety. Let's be willing to proclaim the gospel without fear. Would you pray with me? Father, thank you again for this passage of scripture that you have preserved for us in your word. Lord, in our day and time, we need encouragement, Lord, to be your representatives here in our nation. The tides are changing, Lord. Things are not the way that they were even 20, 30 years ago. But we do not need to be afraid, and we do not uh, need to isolate ourselves from other people that don't see things the way that we do, that don't believe the same way that we do. Lord, help us to go forth as your people, confident that you are the one true God, your word is truth, and in the end, we win. And with the confidence in these things, help us to proclaim your gospel without fear. Give us opportunities this week to do it. I pray in Jesus' name, amen.
Let's close with prayer together. Father, as we leave here and go out into our various walks of life, Lord, we pray that you would enable us to stand for the gospel. You would enable us to stand for truth and righteousness. That you would enable us as we interact with those around us to season our conversation with grace have a high interest in their understanding of who you are if they don't know. Uh, bless this congregation as we go forth. We pray and give glory to your name in Jesus' name.